All right, good morning, everybody. Hope you got yourself some big old cups of coffee. That way we can get into things and talk about all this exciting news going on in the crypto space. I'm uh, going to be running through Chainlink, Ravencoin, Metamask, Cardano, because I gotta, and the Bank of Japan's digital currency, as well as some more stuff. So stick around if you want to hear about what's trending here in the crypto space. And as always, thanks to all those who have subscribed. I really do appreciate it. But hey, to start things off, decentralized platform Ontology has announced a strategic partnership and integration with Chainlink. Woo! It will open up the Ontology platform to Chainlink's bespoke Oracle data service, creating more use cases of data management for the public blockchain platform. Ontology will furthermore enjoy better scalability and decentralization. Now, Ontology is still on a test net. Um, for those of you who don't know, an Oracle, in very, very basic terms, um, allows importation of real-world data to the blockchain, like the score or the outcome of a sports game, to settle a contract on-chain based on the outcome of said game or the spread. Real simple. But the use cases just go from there. There's so many different things you can do with that, and that's kind of the reason Chainlink's such a big... Um, <laughs> cryptocurrency and a very interesting one at that so yeah ontology revealed successfully carried out a native integration with, with Chainlink. Um, so they're going to be able to design smart contracts linked to Chainlink's real world data and they're gonna integrate things uh, they say seamlessly but they had to make some significant changes uh, Chainlink's contracts in ontology's native python smart contract programming language had to be completely rewritten. Uh, Chainlink doesn't use Python, so there were some significant adjustments they had to make to make it compatible, but they're able to do it. But hey, it brings some good benefits. Um, it'll open up more data management use cases. It'll create a surge in on-chain applications with access to off-chain data, as previously mentioned. Uh, however, for now, the emphasis is placed on building Ontology's data management capabilities. This will be made possible with inputting Ontology's identity structure and its wallet into dApps and other enterprise infrastructure. It's This is really good. Uh, Chainlink has been in the news a lot lately with partnering. Uh, they also did the blockchain service network with China, which is interesting to say the very least. Uh, the co-founder of Ontology is pretty happy with this. He is saying it will provide Ontology with ecosystem with a much, much needed boost, and it'll help build a more well-rounded and scalable platform. They're using a lot of buzzwords in this article because at this stage, most things are still theory. They're still experimenting. They're still building the network. This is a project to definitely watch, though, in my own personal opinion, not financial advice. <laughs> um, but yeah. But no, Ontology apparently is known for its fast and user-friendly platform. Uh, it majorly has some major cross-chain collabs, and it's providing businesses with tools needed to create secure blockchain solutions. Uh, the entire ecosystem is powered by its token, ONT, ONT. Chainlink, on the other hand, is very well known for providing top-notch data oracles, which, as said before, can pull real-world data into smart contracts with top firms like Google, Oracle, KyberSwap, and Swift among the beneficiaries of them. Definitely an interesting partnership. Good move for Ontology. Uh, and Chainlink benefits from this as well as they get to prove once again that they not only are not a scam and here to stay, but can provide real world solutions to blockchain's pressing issues. All right, moving on to Ravencoin. Dear Lord, so a vulnerability creates an extra 1.5% of the maximum supply for hackers. And it's a little buzz, buzz, uh, <laughs> clickbaity, buzzwordy. It's kind of weird. So a vulnerability in Ravencoin resulted in the unsanctioned mining of about 1.5% of its maximum supply of 21 billion. So the exploit was disclosed by uh, Ravencoin on Friday after initial reports were confirmed, but details are a little fuzzy. About 315 million Raven were minted, worth about $5.7 million. However, well, they said they notified law enforcement in hopes of catching the unknown perpetrators of the exploit. Uh, through the nature of the bug, no money was actually directly stolen. 
Uh, instead, the losses were spread over all Raven holders as extra inflation, which amounts to about 5% of the current circulating supply. So if you hold Raven, you suddenly held a lot more Raven. So good for you. Uh, team confirmed that it was already exchanged, so there, any type of remediation effort is difficult, nigh impossible, honestly, in my opinion. But according to unconfirmed rumors on the community's Discord, the bug has existed since October and involves a wallet bug. Uh, and actually, the community raised some concerns. This was due to ProgPow, which is a controversial Ethereum-born mining algorithm that was recently adopted. However, team members said the issue was an innocuous GitHub pull request from somewhere else. Hmm. Well, following the post-mortem and the mitigation of this, the community is going to be having to decide what to do with it. Uh, the team suggested to anticipate a planned halving, how having ugh, in 44 days to compensate for this extra supply, though the community might just be like, nah, we'd rather just leave it as it is. So basically, the Ravencoin Foundation company, whatever, uh, they done messed up. They done messed up big. Not sure how, not sure why. Um, at this point, calling it a hack is okay, I guess but it might be an official update contained a vulnerability that was unintentionally exploited. Either way, no one made off with 5.7 million. Uh, it got distributed to Ravencoin holders, so eh, at this point, I personally say, let it be, patch the fix, uh, take the knock, and move on with it. Raven's price will go down, but people forget about this in a bit. Uh, honestly, Ravencoin, I don't know a lot about the project. I know it's a smaller one in the grand scheme of things. But this looks bad, but honestly, I don't think it's going to have much of a long, long-term impact to it other than hurting its street cred. But speaking of street cred, let's talk about someone who actually has some. Old MetaMask. Yeah, that's right. Old MetaMask. So it just updated its wallet, and it has, now has a host of top-notch privacy features. Sweet. Um, they're, calling, they're saying it's got improved user interface and way more security. Uh, if you're living under a rock, it's one of the most popular web-based uh, wallets out there. Uh, it, it works hand-in-hand -hand with a browser extension. I believe you can get it on Google Chrome, Brave, uh, and Opera. I think you might be able to get it on... Firefox as well, but I don't know that for a fact. It's something you should definitely look into, though. But it announced the new features for version 8. The changes are not only include a, quote, slick user interface, but an unparalleled privacy control for when a user connects to a website. So, you know, there we go. To use MetaMask, you need Chrome, Firefox, Opera, or Brave. Uh, once installed, transactions can be made to any Ethereum address. That's kind of nice. So... Yeah, uh, as of right now, prior to the upgrade, uh, wallets that connect to browsers expose your location and your current account to all connected sites. Uh, the new version of the wallet allows users to decide what each site has access to. So this new feature enables you to easily switch between accounts so you control which accounts you interact with. Um, and you can also send encrypted messages um, they're saying infrequent but important messages. You can encrypt them. So they're not turning into a chat app, but they are adding some functionality there. Uh, they're also aiming to help get more users onto Web3. Uh, they noted in their post that his team has been working on and received feedback from app developers that onboarding users when connecting through a MetaMask has been a source of friction. So of course, they're trying to push things forward to counteract that. Some other companies have already like enabled certain features to try to ease that friction. Um, but yeah, it's MetaMask is built on JavaScript, which uh, yeah. Um, they built they also dropped this uh, lava moat, which uh, is for upgrading the security, which is very nice. Um, built into the new wallet. It's a set of tools aimed at preventing cyber attacks and projects built on the Ethereum blockchain are typically prone to more security issues and bugs as it's very complex. 
everything is constantly changing both in the Ethereum's code base and in all these projects code bases so it does get a little tricksy it definitely does but yeah MetaMask gateway to the dApps gotta have it I uh, want to help ease that headache of the friction I talked about before uh, its wallet will now contain an onboarding library enabling applications to implement their own connect button so staying on a web3 application is seamless they're doing it they're pushing metamask is quite an interesting thing it's been around for a while i've used it sparingly i don't have anything bad i can say about it but i have not gotten into the DeFi and dap game too much honestly so yeah it's definitely a good browser-based extension for any of those things and getting you a wallet, but I prefer offline cold storage personally. All right, let's jump over to the old Cardano. The IOHK Virtual Summit is ongoing. The first day was yesterday, second day is today, and boy, oh boy, did they drop a lot yesterday. They announced multiple projects, so let's talk about each one so first things up they announced the atla prism and hereafter i will just call it prism uh, it's designed to address growing risks to cybersecurity and privacy by enabling people to securely exchange personal information on the blockchain that's pretty simple uh, it's the decentralization of consumer identity management it will help to deter cyber attacks by expanding uh, the hackers reach there we go so prism could give almost two billion unbanked people per charles uh an economic identity track global goods from source to sale and de-risk investment in emerging markets in the wake of increasing backlash against silicon valley firms over data privacy this decentralized identity system gives people sovereignty over their data and reduces the risk of data privacy breaches for service providers oh yeah it's gonna old prism is going to give us selective disclosure capabilities through zero knowledge proofs so you would be able as a business to verify consumers age and employment status using a wallet without having to without the person having to worry about irrelevant data being revealed to that company that in and of itself blows my mind you can do that all from a brown all from a wallet it's very interesting it's definitely gonna have some real-world use cases in my opinion a safe secure uh, online identity for yourself that you can share more or less of depending on the information that a site needs and your comfortability level is pretty cool so yeah prism it's not yeah it's not just for the identity uh, they're also working on a traceability solution for supply chains and goods movements as he kind of talked about about up there um, so it'll include a batching scheme on layer two which bundles transactions outside the blockchain and then stores them on it uh, it will have the ability to scale and handle large continuous traffic it will also be able to implement patient records and blockchain based tracing of infections or immunity passports quote on quote uh, we've talked about it in prior videos v chains actually doing this right now with covid 19 so it's interesting to see that they may have a competitor to this depending on the timeline for prism so they also announced their catalyst atlas and what they're calling the c fund so project catalyst is a tool set designed to enable uh ada owners like yours truly to propose and vote on financing proposals for the development of the cardano ecosystem uh, the internal codename project catalyst is just a pilot program the results of which will feed into the development of the final fully decentralized management system this is actually an important step towards the launch of cardano's voltaire um, if you don't know cardano likes to title their various uh, steps in their development as different uh, important scientific and literary figures of the past Voltaire being one of them uh, and it's for a decentralized governance system so like we've talked about it you'll be able to lock a certain amount of ADA for a limited period of time which will allow you to vote on submitted proposals 
They're actually going to have a treasury system eventually, so that a portion of ADA from every transaction will go to the treasury, and then that fund can be used to be voted on for different proposals to continue the development. Very interesting. So the system consists of the node Yormonger, the Catalyst Protocol, a mobile voting app for iOS and Android, and finally Catalyst 0, Catalyst 1, Catalyst 2, which are going to be the release candidates to test the feasibility and usefulness of the voting and funding system. A rollout of Catalyst and thus the next Cardano era, Voltaire, is actually scheduled to take place at the end of the year. So not only are we getting Shelly with voting on, with, uh, sorry, not voting, but staking on the 18th, we might be getting Voltaire and voting at the end of the year, which is insane to me. Still need to be working on uh, Gogan, though, and get them smart contracts going. So, also announced at the virtual summit was the Atlas Project, which aims to create a seamless user experience for Cardano users when interacting with the blockchain. First version will be announced in the coming weeks, and the project was summarized as follows. <clears throat> Our solution will not only tell users about blocks and transactions, but also aggregated statistics, rewards, stake pool metrics, and comparisons. With Project Atlas, we are creating a platform where anyone can go and trade funds, cast a vote, or manage their digital identity. This should seamlessly integrate with your desktop, mobile, or browser. Okay. They're developing something kind of cool. Take in Prism and making it uh, user-friendly, as well as any other project they're working on and making them user-friendly and integrated in a way that you can easily access and see them. Cool. Uh, and then finally, the C fund. It's pretty cool. Um, basically, IOHK is providing 10 million, and Wave plans to raise a further minimum of 10 million to create an initial size of this fund pool of 20, US $20 million partnering up with the Wave Financial Group. Good for them. So it's a venture fund that supports the introduction of blockchain platforms. So it'll make investments worldwide, uh, anywhere between a quarter mil and a half million dollars USD. It will support and invest in startups and early stage companies that base their project products and services on IOK, IOHK's blockchain technologies. So there we go. And we still got another day. They announced this all in one. Uh, like I've said many times, I had a dream Cardano was 10 cents, and I'm hoping that dream comes true. But hey, let's jump over and talk about Japan. They're trying to catch up to China with their own digital, China with its digital currency. Uh, Bank of Japan announced yesterday that it would be expand, experimenting with a central bank digital currency to check its feasibility from a technical perspective. Uh, they want to digitize cash, but it remains to be seen if they can catch up with China. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, major hurdles, uh, universal access and resilience. The former uh, refers to providing access accessibility to everyone, including those without a smartphone. That's the key and the problem. Uh, surprisingly, as of 2018, only 65% of Japanese people have smartphones. So uh, that number will definitely increase as time goes on. But if not everyone's using it, well, then how do you force people to use it? Especially in a free and democratic society like Japan. But uh, yeah, resilience refers to offline availability when electric power is down. Uh, they emphasize the importance of accessibility in any kind of environment. Obviously, Japan is definitely in the earthquake zone. They've had several pretty bad ones in recent years. So if you lose power and you do everything digitally, you now have no access to anything um, so yeah and they're also deciding whether or not they're going to actually use blockchain uh, they like centralized systems because they're as of right now have large capabilities and a very fast transaction speed however blockchain technology while slightly slower is much more resilient if you lose three or four nodes or 33 percent of your miners that's okay. The other ones can pick up the slack versus a centralized system. Server goes down. That's it. Game over. Winners win. Losers lose. So uh, just another example of different governments around the world trying to come up with technology to keep up with the rise in blockchain and the usability of it. Oh, man. 
definitely, definitely something for all of us to keep a close, close eye on. All right, let's jump over into the next five. Talk about food tracing using the blockchain, U.S. digital currencies, Argentina's currency issues, dApp volumes, and crypto use cases to round things out. What fun. So, oh man. Yeah, so tracing food by the 2027 will... Uh, help us save billions of dollars, according to a recent report by Cointelegraph Consulting and VeChain. See, you can't go a day without VeChain either. So, the report forecasts about $300 billion worth of food items will be traced along the supply chain within seven years. Oh man, so the lack of transparency, transparency and accountability in the global in food industry supply chain actually costs billions of dollars. Uh, it's believed that as much as 20% of global wine sales, or $6 billion, are counterfeit. So what you're buying isn't actually what is uh, in the bottle. And things get even fishier <laughs> when it comes to seafood. 25-70% to 70 of red snapper, wild salmon, and Atlantic cod are disguised by species that are less desirable, cheaper, and more readily available. That can affect a lot of things. One, you're not getting the value for what you're paying for. And two, it might not be safe if they're already scammy enough to counterfeit what type of fish you're buying. Their protocols on safety might not be the best either. So, tracing items along the supply chain using blockchain is one of the better explored use cases for the technology. IBM's leading the way as a service provider with many global, global industry leaders like Walmart, Carflower, and the California Giant Berry Farms are all joining up with the party pretty interesting real world use cases this is actually what v chain is kind of doing right now and cardano just announced that they're going to be doing so the blockchain and internet of things are often used in tandem as additional benefits may be achieved by connecting the two uh, internet of things sensors for example temperature sensors for frozen items can send accurate information about food items to the blockchain network providing stakeholders with a snapshot of the entire supply chain the data can be used to assure foods genuineness freshness and overall quality um, they're hoping that the combination of blockchain and the internet of things will uh, help the industry save billions of dollars. Hopefully about 70 billion and create an additional 47 billion dollars in revenue. So that's pretty nice. Uh, in addition, they're hoping to reduce potential losses due to food safety risk by 12 to 14. So again, this is the type of stuff to keep an eye out if you're thinking about investing tell you do your research I'm not an expert I'm some dude yelling at a microphone in front of his computer in a basement but do your research look through things but in my opinion these are the type of things to look for what are going to be the real world applications and who are the projects who are working towards providing a real service to meet those real world needs so uh, Chainlink, VeChain, Cardano, Ethereum uh, things like that I think do have real futures because they offer solutions to these problems. Alrighty, jumping on over to the United States debating a digital dollar. They're not actually working on anything, but in a hearing before the Senate Banking Committee held on uh, old Tuesday, old Tom Cotton uh, from Arkansas uh, stated the U.S. needs a digital dollar. The U.S. dollar has to keep earning that place in the global payment system. It has to be better than Bitcoin. It has to be better than a digital one. Uh, the committee chair all acknowledged the importance of it. So some lawmakers are pushing for this because China is aggressively working on their own digital currency. Uh, we've talked about that before on this channel. A ranking member, Sherrod Brown from Ohio, is focused on the implementation of the folk of the of a virtual currency bleh, 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 saying he believes tech companies can't be trusted to build or maintain the technology uh, I mean he's not wrong any one company I wouldn't trust but decentralized systems I'm much more likely to because no one trusts anyone in those systems um, so the system as a whole I have more trust in because I know that everything is verified 
that type of stuff. So a uh, number of witnesses were invited to the hearing, vouched for it. Um, you know, they talk, you know, Duke University Professor Nikita Katino, Paxo CEO, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission Chair. You know, they're all saying a digital dollar will help address an outdated financial system. Uh, and Chris Giancarlo says Darwin said the most adaptable survive. I think that's true when we transition to a new architecture to adapt it. It will help bring benefits to society at large. Oh man, so the American Bankers Association, or old people, has come out against a virtual dollar saying it could transform the Federal Reserve into the nation's near monopoly provider of our currency, bank accounts, and payment services. Yeah, aren't they already? Like, that's a legit question. Like, that's pretty much what they are. Like, yeah, they are the only one who can provide legal currency in the U.S. And they sh insure all our bank accounts. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it would add payment services to that list. But if Chase Bank collapses overnight and all my money vanishes, it's insured by the government and I will get that money back. So they kind of already do two of the three. Yeah, just whatever. So uh, hop on over to Argentina. Uh, it's joining the Lebanese Lira in a slump to Satoshi parody. Uh, we talked yesterday, I believe it was, how the Lebanese currency, the dollar has, sh the value of a dollar there is equivalent to one Satoshi. Argentina, their penny, their centavo is now worth approximately one Satoshi as well. I keep bringing these articles up because it's showing just how this global pandemic and tr resulting recession is exacerbating underlying problems that blockchains like Bitcoin and others can solve. So it joins the growing ranks of countries, the Centavo, with currencies that have hit parity with the smallest unit of Bitcoin, uh, they're at the <laughs> Argentina is in the midst of a currency crisis. Uh, inflation is around 50%. Dear Lord. Uh, the Centavo has been in circulation since 1854. So it's been around a little bit. Uh, claiming that every fiat currency in history had failed. Argentinian Redditor, one more one. Oh, look at that. Some random dude's paying honey pop. Good for him. All right. Brought the Centavo's plight to the world's attention. Only yesterday, Decrypt noted that the Lebanese Lira is now equivalent to Bitcoin's smallest denomination as well. Uh, so limits on currency conversions, regulations, fees, and taxes make using the official rate of Argentine pesos to dollar inaccessible. Instead, an unofficial rate, the blue dollar, has sprung up. Currently, the unofficial rate is 119 ARS to the dollar. So, hmm. Yeah. But yeah, no, they've got their own economic crisis going on since 2018, third year of recession, even before the pandemic hit. So they are struggle bussing, as are many of us right now. Again, blockchain can solve all this. It's a larger decentralized system that's much more stable than some of these currencies, which to many of us is still a weird and crazy thing to think. But hey. Let's move on, talk about some dApps. Volume hit 12 billion, woo, as of Q2 2020, uh, a 4.5 billion increase from the previous quarter, and Ethereum-based apps alone accounted for 82% of that figure. However, Tron and EOS are still out there and continue to grow, while the recently launched Hive is already recording more dApp activity than its predecessor, Steam. So yeah. This is pretty funded by the DeFi revolution, as some people would be calling it right now. Maybe it's a DeFi fad, but eh, I'm inclined to, I'm starting to think it's not going to be a fad. I think it might be around for a little bit. The much talked about Compound, or Comp, is the most valuable DAP by transaction volume with 1.2 billion, having passed through that lending protocol alone. Uh, not all aspects of the Ethereum DAP space are thriving, however. Uh, due to increased gas prices on Ethereum and transaction fees, gaming dApps saw an 80% drop quarter on quarter. 
uh, high gas prices are killing games on Ethereum, and it's something they're definitely going to have to address here soon. Um, so yeah, despite Ethereum's dominance, dominance in dApps, uh, EOS and Tron have shown increased daily activity. Uh, in fact, the three months between Q1 and Q2, Tron transaction volume increased by 17,210%. Wow, while the sudden spike can be largely attributed to Oikos.cash, a Tron version of Ethereum's compound lending app. There we go, daps, daps, daps. So although Tron's move into DeFi has proven successful, DAP Radar notes the majority of Tron DAP activity is still originates from apps in the gambling and high risk categories. So eh, EOS DAP wallet activity had actually dropped going from 2019 to 2020, uh, thanks to network congestion caused by uh, an airdrop. <laughs> Good job EOS, oh man. So yeah, and then data from DAP Radar also shows that the recently launched Hive, which hard forked from Tron in early 2020, has already taken over its ancestor chain in terms of daily DAP volume. Much of the activity comes from the Hive-based blockchain game Splinterlands. So there we go. DAPs are growing. They're developing. Not uh, seamlessly, though. There's some friction, particularly on Ethereum. And hopefully Ethereum is getting ready to address those things because Cardano's creeping up on you. They launch smart contracts in Gogan, and they can do it better. And you don't upgrade. People will eventually switch, or they'll go to Tron, or they'll go to... EOS. Um, I'm not a fan of EOS. I'm, I'm not going to lie. If you are, I'm sorry. I hope you prove me wrong, but I'm not a fan. So, uh, yeah, no, Ethereum is the leader of the pack, but they need to keep an eye about on the new boys in town. All right, so um, this last article, I've mentioned on the channel before how strongly I feel about Africa and cryptocurrencies, and this article popped up was sponsored so take everything that's said in here with a grain of salt but i agree with the views 100 percent so i figured i'd talk about it because this is my gall darn youtube channel and i can do what i want or podcast if you're listening on my podcast so twitter and square ceo recently said africa will define the future especially the bitcoin one but was he right uh yeah i think he's right so even though it's a very diverse continent African nation often share key similarities. Uh, they have pretty much across the board some socioeconomic issues and an, a significant lack of infrastructure. The use of cryptocurrencies around the world has to date largely centered on investment, speculation, and trading, but that's not true of Africa. Applications for crypto and the scope of the challenges it faced could help it overcome and vary far more. So it's actually a pretty fertile breeding ground. So it's pretty interesting. There's a polarity to crypto adoption. Um, research have identified high ownership rates in certain countries. Uh, Google trend data indicates Uganda, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana all rank in the top 10 on the top, all rank in top 10 on the topic of cryptocurrency, which demonstrates a growing interest in them. South Africa is actually ranked third highest worldwide at 13%, with Nigeria ranking fifth, or 11%, in a survey about crypto ownership. In terms of crypto infrastructure, though, it's lagging behind. There's a distinct lack of nodes, mining operations, and supporting merchants. Of the 10,267 Bitcoin nodes worldwide, just 20%, just 20, sorry, 0.2% are located in Africa. Wow. But yeah, no. Worldwide, crypto ownership is averaging about 7% of people aged 16 to 64. Nigeria's got 11, South Africa's got 13. But, so Africa's underdeveloped crypto infrastructure aside, there's a bunch of things that you can actually argue will do it. Uh, the majority of African nations have very high inflation rates very uneven currencies, and historically, they're much higher than the global average, and it undermines their purchasing power and potential for wealth gain. However, if you were to take your African dollars and buy into Bitcoin today, you'd actually earn way more just on the fact that your currency would inflate so high that as long as Bitcoin stayed the same, you'd come out ahead, because then you could buy back in for the same value, but get way more. 
So in the same vein, many African countries suffer from depreciating and often volatile national currencies. The South African Rand has lost over 50% of its value against the dollar. Oof. So they've got political instability and capital control. Like, they're, they're rough. Um, 2019 registered the highest amount of civil conflicts since 1946. This type of vulnerability has an adverse knock-on effect on issues like forced migration, GDP collapse, and wealth confiscation. And they do not have traditional financial infrastructure. So the number of commercial banks per 100,000 adults is 61% lower across sub-Sahara Africa than the global average. So in that case, uh, many <laughs> sub-Saharan African populations live in rural areas and that's actually a good thing for mobile and digital solutions. Unlike other regions, many African nations just they, they leapfrog traditional finance and they've gone straight to mobile banking. And that's perfect for cryptocurrency adoption. You're already trading everything on your phone. Why not get rid of that crappy, crappy local currency that keeps inflating and makes it harder to do anything for a much more stable crypto? Why not? I mean, why not? So, yeah. Uh, inadequate internet coverage is an issue, but over the past few years, the satellite industry has grown tremendously. Companies like SpaceX, Amazon, Viasat, and OneWeb are building low-orbit satellites, um, mega constellations that aim to provide high-speed internet across the globe. And that right there, once you've got it across the globe, you can invest in Africa, they'll pay you in Bitcoin, and you know that Bitcoin's going to increase exponentially in value. So you can provide it as a service and take the bare bones, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Margin. So that way, even if you come out even, you know the value of Bitcoin is going to increase later. Will a company actually do that? I doubt it, but it's pretty interesting. They're doing a lot of things here. Like I said, this was a sponsored one, but it just shows that cryptocurrency future in Africa is bright in my opinion. I know Cardano's in the space. Um, old Acon with his A coins in the space. We're going to be seeing a lot of interesting things come out of this continent in the next uh, 25 years in my opinion. But all right, that does it. All 10 articles for today. Thanks for taking this journey with me once again. If you're still here, like, comment, subscribe. If you're listening on the podcast, just subscribe or leave a comment, leave a rating. Help me get some more views there too. I appreciate anything you can do. Uh, going through the top 10, it's a pretty red day today. Cardano is even-ish. They're up 0.55%, sitting at 9.5 cents. Like I said, I was hoping for 10. I keep, I'm, I want my dreams to come true. But it is closing in on the number seven spot, potentially flipping Litecoin for market cap. Be interesting to see uh, if Cardano maintains or if they see a dump with the close of the summit at the end of today. There's nothing we can do but wait and see. Otherwise, it's pretty blah. The only other cryptocurrency in the top 10 that's positive is EOS, sitting at number 10, 2.75% up. Uh, Crypto.com coins essentially even on the day at number 11 and chain link at number 12 is positive half a percent so i will talk to you guys all soon thank you for listening thank you for being here and have an awesome freaking day bye